In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this live cast, Redesigning the Textile Industry. Um, this is a collaboration of Pakhuis de Zwijger, the Royal Academy of the Arts in The Hague, and uh, the European project Reflow, which is a project about uh, having a better use of uh, resources within cities with a uh, pilot here in Amsterdam about the textile industry. Uh, my name is Thomas van der Zand. I am a programmer at Pakhuis de Zwijger and one of the members of the Amsterdam uh, pilot team of Reflow. I am uh, joined here at the table uh, by uh, Mike Rosenberg. Uh, she is uh, the head of the department for the Master of Industrial Design at KABK, which is the uh, Royal Dutch Academy of the Arts. Um, and uh, I'm joined in Zoom uh, by two other uh, members of the panel, uh, which I will introduce later. Um, uh, and we are joined here by six students of the KABK, and they will present their project on redesigning the textile industry in, uh, on which they have worked uh, in the last semester. Uh, but first, uh, uh, Maika, I will start with you. Um, good to have you here. And, Thank you. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this project uh, that the uh, students have been involved in. Why does an institute like KABK think it's important to work with industrial design students on a topic like redesigning the textile industry? Well, first of all, this master program is really aiming to redesign the industry. So we built the system. Um, for years and years after the Industrial Revolution, and by now we start to, well, question if it really works or if it still works. Um, so there's, of course, a lot of pollution. There is a lot of uh, social in on inequality. There, there, there. It's quite mainstream culturally seen. Um, so we're really focusing on redesigning this system and questioning this system. And of course, the textile industry is one of the most polluting industries we have. Um, so it's a really interesting topic to work on. Um, and at the same time, it's also really um, uh, fascinating and broad because it has cultural um, um, aspects. It, it goes about aesthetics, but also about style, about uh, ecology, about economics. Uh, so it has uh, a lot of um, uh, subjects that it all unites within this theme. Yeah, and, and uh, involving all these uh, societal subjects, but also e economics and, and all of these things, is that something that you do more and more often as an uh, arts academy? Well, I think for designers especially, all these uh, fields come together. So you're not a, an, an, you're not and sculpture, you work with the industry, you work with economic systems, you work with aesthetics, but also with functionality. So it, it really um, uh, is a broad um, uh, subject to work on, and it brings all these aspects together. Yeah, and for, for what year was this uh, project in which you collaborated with Reflow? For uh, which year students? Uh, this is a first year students uh, project. So uh, they are working for two years on this master degree and this is like a sort of entrance project to at the one side look really at the broad system but also um, how you can research it and how you can make products that uh, sort of show different approaches on the industry. Yeah, and, and the subject of, of textiles and fashion and uh, the, the um, sustainability of that is that a uh, topic that re resonates with these uh, students, do you think? Maybe we can ask them later, but what, <laughs> what did you notice? Well, I think it does, in the sense that um, uh, more and more um, there is an awareness that you not just can design the next thing without looking at the impact it has. And I think especially in textiles, that's really important. 
but also really w rich to work from. So it also embeds products you make. Yeah. And um, we've um, so we're we're going to hear a couple of pitches of all of the students. They've worked on a variety of different uh, projects, and um, within Reflow, we've made a textile wheel that uh, explains what kind of steps there are to uh, really close the circle within the textile industry. And there are different ways to do that, and there are different entry points to work on that mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe you can because I think the students took that as a starting point for for their ideas and their work right well they really looked they used the research that was done and what is really interesting about this research is that it sort of maps the whole system and also where value disappears or where where things are discarded and that gives a sort of entry point to look at the system, but also to find a way to intervene. So where can I, as a designer, intervene in the system and maybe add value or keep value or um, um, yeah, come up with a project that, uh, that sort of gives a sort of speculation on how you could redesign the system. Yeah, that's great. And maybe we can have a closer look at, at what entry points uh, the, the students have focused. We can go back to the, uh, to the textile wheel and then see, uh, maybe on the next slide, see where all the student uh, projects are, are involved in. Uh, can, can you explain a little bit what we see here? And uh, w we will hear about the projects later, but uh, can you explain a little bit at what entry points they, uh, they started? Yeah. So this is a little sketch I made to sort of show where the projects um, uh, are within the wheel. And I think what's really interesting when I mapped them is that I saw, ah, they all took really different points of entrance. So they are, yeah. so we didn't really brief that on them. They were quite, it was quite open. Um, but it's interesting that I find so many different ways to work within this system. Um, and it's also, I think, really interesting that it's, dealing with this whole system of fabrication, but then it's also narrowing down almost to uh, one fiber, and then it's uh, opening up again, like, but how could this have impact for the whole system? So it really became different projects that show sort of potential ways to intervene in this system. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and uh, maybe we can uh, uh, we can share this slide again with uh, with some of the viewers if they feel like it. I, um, I I forgot to say in my introduction that everybody who's watching, uh, you can all ask your question as well, or you can make your remarks as well. Uh, if you participate through Zoom, you can chat with each other uh, in the chat and ask your questions on the Q and A, please. Keep your, uh, your questions short and snappy, but and also uh, say to which of the speakers you want to ask your questions, and we'll try and answer them during this uh, show. So I hope to, uh, to get the questions in here on, uh, on, on my iPad. Um, uh, for now, I want to introduce the other uh, members of the panel who are not here but are joining us through Zoom. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, Luz Bogers. Uh, she's an associate uh, professor of applied sciences in, in Amsterdam. And uh, you are giving shape to uh, a learning community around critical making. Maybe uh, you can explain uh, to everybody who's watching what critical making is exactly. Uh, I'll try, I'll do my best, but... Uh... You can write books about it, but I'll, I'll try to uh, summarize at least how I understand it. Um, I think critical making is a bit of an umbrella term, so there's lots of stuff that could fit under this um, name. But I think it's a, it's a term for a lot of practices that understand that technological artifacts always embody cultural values. Um, and I think that fashion items and textile items are highly technological uh, artifacts, by the way, but I'm sure we'll uh, see more about that. Um, and we tend to become a bit blind to the value systems that we create because they become so ingrained in our practices and in our minds. Um, uh, like Mike also said, we built this system from the Industrial Revolution and all of a sudden we have it. And it's kind of hard to unlearn that. Um, but they do shape the way that we live and work and assign value to things. So you could say that these um, systems and the value systems that are ingrained in them, they lock us into cycles of overworking overproducing and overconsuming, um, and this is a quote from Matt Ratto. and this has devastating environmental consequences. 
Now I think um, to practice critical, critical making is to unsettle these abstract value systems in a very hands-on way by engaging with things, with tools, with materials, and proposing ways to break out of those cycles. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and in the University of Applied Sciences, you work from uh, the, the um, uh, Fashion Institute, AMFI. Uh, and uh, what is this, uh, in, in this learning community, what kind of uh, people do you have there and what do they keep themselves busy with? Do you have some examples? Um, I do. So one of the main partners internally is indeed AMFI, that's the fashion school at the University of Applied Sciences. But I also collaborate with three uh, research groups. One of them is the Fashion Research and Technology Research Group. So that's very on topic with the fashion school, of course. But we all, I also work with a research group for visual methodologies. So that encompasses all kinds of ways of doing visual research. And then thirdly, um, the lecturers for play and civic media. And that's much more about city making and what it needs to kind of, you know, build a, build a society. So. I kind of, as, as broad as those partners are, that's also how broad uh, all the people involved are. And, but in general, there's students, there's researchers, and there's also external partners involved as well as educators. Yeah, and, and you also work on a methodology, and it's called uh, Research by Design. Um, so uh, I, I have some idea of what it is, but could you elaborate on that as well? Yeah, I think you could say that research through design, um, when you look at the literature, it's a, a research approach that um, holds a bunch of methods and processes kind of coming from design, from design um, practice, and says that those are legitimate ways of doing research, of kind of um, yeah, generating knowledge, doing inquiry, you would say. But I personally really love this um, definition that the Design Academy also uses, and they say, research, you can do that to discover how things are, but you can also do it to question conventional wisdom and to criticize the way we do things, the way we practice our professions, as well as exploring opportunities for change. And I think this one definitely resonates also with the idea of critical making. Um, yeah, so, so, so this, is, this is exactly what the students uh, have, have tried to do here during this project. So I'm, I'm glad you, you're joining us. And you're joining us uh, together with another uh, panel member, uh, Syl Lichtmeier. Um, uh, good to have you here as well. Uh, you're an uh, entrepreneur and uh, you call yourself a regenerative leadership trainer. Um, and and uh, you are involved in uh, in, in uh, ecosystem restoration camps. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those? Oh, sorry. I think you're on mute, so maybe you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for having me here. And what the eco restoration camps is about? It's a it's a global and inclusive and bottom up movement. We help more and more people to restore natural ecosystems to preserve the web of life and at the same time offer a platform for everyone to help and learn. Together we are restoring the earth. I myself got involved after a trip through South America where I visited a rainforest that was being restored. This was a very beautiful example of how an ecosystem uses complexity to create trust and abundance. It showed me how we do the opposite, aim for fear and scarcity to power our systems. Well, we, if we appreciate complexity, we can create abundance and trust. Yeah, yeah. And um, you're also um, uh, in, in your regenerative leadership uh, trainings, uh, if, if I may say so. Uh, yeah. You're focusing on different skills than uh, probably um, are, are usually trained in these uh, in these academies that uh, um, like KABK. Can you tell us a little bit about the leadership skills that you, you talk about? Well, it's actually we try to combine things, you know. It's we often forget to connect to nature. It's vital that we remember or relearn how to read the patterns, relationships, energies and insights that the intelligence of life has has. This reconnection to life's logic will be valuable in finding our way to a more balanced structure or new way of thinking that enables people in our planet to thrive years ahead. And I think actually that we, you know, we, we uh, can embrace this abundant power that nature has and um, find new entrances to uh, look at our systems. 
Yeah, and, and are there any like uh, practical um, uh, skills that uh, the, the leaders of the future, the regenerative leaders of the future, need to really make an impact if they, uh, uh, the, to the students uh, that, that maybe come out of their uh, studies and they really want to make an impact on the industry, what's the first thing that they uh, need to have to become a regenerative leader? Well, that's a very difficult question. What I would be happy to answer, although I think it lies in the complexity, you know, looking at nature, being open, um, having trust, accept failure and be open to learn instead of creating closed systems that only look within yeah then look with reflection back to yourself okay great well uh thanks for being here we'll uh, reflect on uh, some of the student pitches that we are going to see now so i would like uh, Baudouin to already stand ready for for his pitch um, uh, and we're going to reflect on that uh, on the first three pitches in a minute with uh, all of the panelists. Um, but first, I would like to give the floor to uh, Boudewijn Buitenhek, who is giving a short pitch on redesigning buttons for recycling. Boudewijn, are you ready? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, well, hi everyone. I'm uh, Boudewijn, and today I would like to talk to you about what I like to call the smallest problem in the fashion industry. And it's the button. See, uh, the button is something that is often overlooked when talking about the problems in the textile industry. Um, and back in the day, buttons were something you know really nice from beautiful materials, well designed. And these days, buttons are often just you know cheap metal or plastic things attached to your clothing that you discard whenever you throw away the garment. And um, see, much of the problem with Textile recycling these days is the ever-growing complexity of it. It's, it's getting more and more complex with all the materials. And uh, buttons only add to this problem. And I would like to read you a quote from the bbc.com slash future. Much of the problem with recycling textile comes down to what our clothes are made from. The fabrics we drape over our bodies are complex combinations of fibers, fixtures, and accessories. They are, man, they are made for problematic blends of natural yarns, man-made filaments, plastics, and metals. And so to help, uh, to assist in reducing this complexity problem, and hopefully in the future create some more mono-material garments, I started thinking if it would be possible to create buttons out of the fabric that the garment is made from as well. So I started looking into history, and I, um, and I also took a lot of inspiration from traditional uh, knot fastening techniques. And that's how I ended up with, uh, or yeah, that's when I started experimenting with different uh, production techniques, different materials. And I ended up with three sets of garments with full sets of buttons, and I'm wearing one right now. And um, yeah, the first one is a, a roll fastener. It's uh, this one I developed for thicker fabrics. And then there's the embroidered fastener. I uh, developed this one for synthetic fibers. And last, there's the rope fastener. This one is made from rope spun from uh, recycled fabric strips. Uh, this was a technique developed by one of my peers. Yeah, and in conclusion, I would like to say that I think all these three uh, different uh, concepts of fabric fasteners uh, all serve a different role or purpose in, in hopefully reducing this complexity in the, in the fabric industry. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Yeah, it was a, a great presentation and exactly within the time uh, that we set for you. So well done. Uh, Mike, uh, can you give um, like a short reaction or maybe do you have a question for Baudin as well? Um, well, first of all, I think this is an interesting example on focusing on a really small thing which shows um, uh, that there's a huge problem behind it, like this mono, uh, if we make it of yeah. less materials, that should ha that could help. And the button is a sort of mascot for that idea. Um, yeah, we have the same thing with like labels in the, uh, yeah. in the clothing and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, but it also makes you aware of the fact that it works like that. So it's also a bit of a conversation piece on itself, if you make something like that. Yeah. Um, a question for Baudoin. Well, what could be the um, ideal impact if you would implement this, Baudouin? 
Yeah, well, hopefully, you know, when, when we visited uh, the recycling uh, facilities, I, I saw that, you know, they, they shred the material and it, it, it just gets a little more complex to figure out how to uh, split all these uh, different materials apart. And, you know, something as small as this, it's, it's a, a minor habit change, a minor shift in the way we think, uh, could already, you know, reduce a little bit of that complexity and, uh, you know, make, it, make the whole textile life cycle a little simpler, so. And I cannot really see it, but are you wearing it now, yes, right now? Yes, yeah. I'm, well, at least one of them. This is <laughs> the one with the, for the thicker materials, the roll, roll fabric one. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah very nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, uh, please um, go back to your seat and we'll ask uh, the, the next pitcher to uh, come forward. Uh, Jakov, Jakov Habjan. Um, uh, and uh, you've been uh, busy with uh, durable products for uh, like shredded fibers. So what do you do after you shred fibers and uh, uh, what do you do with these things? Um, tell us a little bit about that in two minutes. The floor is yours. Yes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Yakov, and I will tell you a bit about my project Over Waste. Uh, my starting point for this project were some of the frustrations and uh, problems that I felt in, this, uh, in the whole industry of uh, fashion and textiles. We buy a lot of stuff because new collections coming out every week. We buy a lot of things and we value something that is uh, an image uh, as opposed to its uh, quality of the material. And to make things more absurd, there are these big companies who are just burning uh, millions worth of uh, clothes for the sake of brand identity. All this is actually, all these uh, causes are leading to the title of the project being over waste. Um, this waste, um, this textile, uh, mixed textile fiber is presenting itself in, in, in this form in huge quantities in recycling uh, facilities. Um, and my direction uh, for uh, the design was actually going be beyond clothing, outside of the world of garments. And the process of making this material uh, consists of mixing the shredded and mixed uh, fibers with a binder, pressing them into boards. Um, the physicality of, of this material is really close to plastic, and uh, the, the content are very, very apparent. So depending on the mix of fibers, the content is really visible. I think that's a really, very st uh, strong value of this material, which brings me actually to the first uh, proposal for an application, which is in, within our everyday context, um, with an aim to raise awareness about uh, our material and garment belongings, how, mu how much stuff do we actually need, how much stuff do we have, how do we store them, and where is this new material, uh, where does this come from, what's the origin of it. Um, and the second uh, possible applications I see in the world of uh, yeah, big fashion brands who are, like I mentioned, really destroying a lot of uh, unsold clothes for the sake of uh, their brand. So this material is providing them with a model for brand transparency, um, providing them with a model to maybe uh, embrace this material which, is, which they consider to be waste uh, as opposed to burning it and uh, create their business as a more circular package. Uh, and create a more honest product. Um, yeah. So in the end, I hope that uh, we see this product uh, in our everyday context of a home and also uh, in the shelves of some store, stores who, who care about our tomorrow. Thank you, Yakov. Very, very nice. It's, I also like it that you uh, are going to put it back into our, uh, our closets uh, as a, like... Um little uh, um, clothing holders. Uh, Luz, do you want to uh, give a short comment or ask a question to Jakob? Uh, yeah, Jakob, thank you for your, uh, for your pitch. Um, I think it's really interesting how you want to show the origin of the fiber that kind of returns into the board. Um, I am kind of wondering, I have two questions. One of them is, can I maybe see a close-up of some of your products? Because it's a bit hard to see from where I'm sitting. Um, can, we, can, can we maybe put that uh, into a full screen close-up? Can you see it now? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, and then one of the applications is, was a bit harder to see. So I'd like to see that again if you have it. There we go. Well, maybe. Oh, yeah, really nice. So I'm really curious, um, Jakob, how do you imagine that this waste, is it like a one-on-one -on -one loop where the waste of one clothing company would come back to them? Or would it be kind of from a general heap of bulk and then 
there's a percentage that goes back to the company, or how do you do you have a do you have an idea of how you would imagine that relationship of how it gets kind of comes back? You mean to the uh, to the company in this context of uh, high fashion? Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing I found really, really shocking is that these companies who usually shred uh, fiber, uh, shred textiles into fibers, are receiving packages from companies who are deliberately paying to these companies, to these recycling facilities, to destroy their unsold merch. So I, th I see this as a 100% uh, outcome for, for, for example, if these companies embrace this, okay, we have to destroy our, our unsold clothes, but let's bring them back into our, our, our system and yeah. use this material. It's already here, so why not? Yeah, to bring it back to their doorstep in a way. That's, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, there, there's also uh, uh, a short question from Zoom uh, to Yaakov. Uh, what sort of binder do you use? Uh, I did research with two. One of them was starch-based and the other was uh, epoxy-based. I did some research into bio-based epoxies, which are uh, easily, uh, easily, more easier to biodegrade. Uh, so also the application and the, the durability of the, of the material really depends on the binder. Uh, starch is perfectly fine. Starch-based binders are perfectly fine for indoor applications. But something that needs to be more durable is, yeah, that's a, a more complicated okay. scenario. Yeah, thank you very much for now. Um, uh, Nina, please already um, uh, go to the, uh, to the pitching spot. You were, you were laughing when I was uh, talking about binders. Is that something you uh, paid attention to and it was uh, something of an issue within the project? Well, um, of course, there is a lot of uh, chemicals that you can use. And a lot of time you have a really idea of recycling stuff and then you add materials that make it really bad yeah so it's always a bit a tricky thing so you you cannot use um uh if you design something you have to think about all these ingredients and yeah. not just focus on yes but i use recycled fibers but then you have to look at like the whole process you use as well yeah you have to do so a i thought it was a really design. good question yeah yeah, yeah. You have to uh, not, not do uh, a single step that's maybe more durable and then another step that's actually less sustainable or takes more energy. Or Yeah, and that happens a lot. But it's also really hard to look at the whole system that what you are doing. But that makes it really important. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, if everything is well, uh, Nina Skarjanj uh, is now uh, ready to pitch um, the Crystal Couture kit. I'm very curious. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you for having me. So one of the reasons for the immense pollution of textile industry doesn't come just from the industry, but also from us, the consumer. For example, an average EU consumer per year buys 26 kilos of clothing, wears it on average only se uh, seven times, and then throws away 11 kilos of it. But there's small things we can do, uh, all of us, that we can contribute towards solving, solving this problem. For example, if we would wear a garment only seven months longer, it would diminish its envir environmental impact by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, that's why uh, the focus of this project was to encourage consumers to use more of their clothing they already have and buy less new clothing they don't actually need. Um, nowadays, we feel this constant need for novelty which is usually satisfied by buying new clothes. But what if we could add novelty to the clothing we already have at home, for example, like with the uh, tie-dye movement? Uh, that's why I decided to make a DIY crystallization set uh, called Crystal Couture, uh, which allows you to grow temporary crystals on your clothing. So the crystals basically work like a sustainable temporary glitter that you can wear one day and wash off the next. Uh, that way you can add novelty to your clothing over and over again. The making process is quite simple. Uh, it consists of first making the saturated alum solution and then immersing the garment into it and leave it until the crystal starts forming on top of the garment. Um, well, this process offers especially a sustainable alternative to, uh, to uh, especially for a special occasion wear, which we wear far less than everyday wear. Um, and after, wa after wearing it, you can easily wash it in a washing machine, uh, which could return it to its previous state. Um, even though the solution is currently small scale, it could become a widespread DIY movement, which could engage individu individuals to, through social media or um, DIY platforms or workshops. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, coming back to the same point that we talked about uh, just now, 
Um, what kind of materials uh, are, are these uh, these glitters uh, from, and, and how sustainable are those materials when they are washed away in the washing machine? Yeah, so the crystals basically form from uh, aluminium salt, which is basically a kind of a salt, um, which, yeah, which through, when it's being cooled down, forms crystals, basically. So in... Uh, yeah, the, this kind of salt is not really destructible, destructible to the environment, especially not in a small um, yeah, quantities like that. So um, when you would wash it in your washing machine, it would be potentially harmless to the environment. And do you think it would be a, a affordable uh, kit? I mean, um, uh, when I worked with it, uh, it was affordable. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's uh, uh, the salt itself is not expensive. So anybody could learn how to use it. Anybody could use it uh, however they want, which would also inspire the new generation of makers. Okay, Sil, do you have uh, any question from your uh, perspective? Well, the sustainability question was on top of my mind. Uh, but first of all, I want to say I think it's a beautiful example of how you could create an open and living system that can uh, thrive and grow. Um, as I mentioned, the sustainability question was, was kind of on my mind. Um, I was wondering, you know, washing away, have you ever thought about what we all wash away through our uh, washing machines and how many microfibers and microplastics go through your washing machine? Oh yeah, uh, that was also one of the stuff I researched. And yeah, it's it's quite a big problem, especially with the uh, low quality clothing we, yeah, uh, fast fabricated clothing we use nowadays. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, uh, what's the question again? Yeah, so in, in, yeah. Uh, uh, did, uh, how, uh, how much did you study it and uh, oh, yeah. was it any influence in your, uh, in the rest of your project? I mean, the inspiration didn't really come from there. It was more the inspiration about how can you upcycle your clothing for uh, multiple inst times instead of just one. To um, yeah, so the the washing away uh, kind of function comes mostly from that. But yeah, oh. I agree with your statement that uh, the the microfibers are a real problem. All right, uh, there's also a question from Luz. I'm sorry to keep you uh, just a little longer. Uh, Luz. Yeah, maybe just a suggestion. Um, when you're working with alum crystals, of course, alum is also a non mordant for natural dyes. I'm sure you know this. But you could even maybe create a new loop when you wash off your alum crystals that you use the wastewater to use as a mordant to do natural dyeing. You can make loops of crystals and natural dyeing and crystals and natural dyeing until it's fully exhausted. Very yeah, nice idea. Um, I, I want to thank you, Nina, for now. And uh, we're uh, going on with the next uh, two student pitches in a while. But first, uh, Luz, I would like to come back to you and um, talk a little bit about the role of research design uh, and, and uh, making in, in really changing this, uh, this industry. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'd like to you to come back to the pitches. Is there something that has struck with you in these first three pitches? Ooh. Well, it's indeed nice to see how different they all are and that they take very different entry points. Um, but, but I think from the first pitch, what um, stuck with me that Boudewijn mentioned is that um, buttons, they're kind of in the way of thinking about mono materials. And I thought, yeah, Literally, the material of a button is often not even on the material label, like the material it's made of. I don't think it's listed usually even. So that's something that I kind of started thinking about and I hadn't before. So that was really nice for me. Okay, yeah. And um, in what way uh, can these like student projects really offer new paths to the industry, do you think? For, for students or for designers? For a designer, so let's take it broader. Also, uh, uh, when you finish and as a designer, you go on and, and uh, you think about this, how can you really impact the industry? Yeah, well, I think that one of the superpowers that designers have or that they're trained to develop, I suppose, is that they, they see opportunities for beauty and use in almost anything. And I think that's like an incredible uh, power to have. 
because design has the um, design can offer ways of making things attractive, desirable, worthy of attention, even in places where we didn't think we would find desirable things or beauty. Um, and of course, that's very interesting to industry. How would it not be interesting to industry? That's what it all runs off of, you know. But I think that um, what we really need to design is kind of the models that prescribe ongoing growth. I think we really need to design the exits from those models and our collective addi addiction to, uh, to economic growth and even maybe to consumerism, even maybe to novelty. I think we have to kind of find ways out of that as well. Yeah, yeah, guys, it's good to hear you all have potential superpowers. So I remember that. And um, yeah, so coming back to this design approach, uh, that's what you really think has uh, is the offer to the industry as well, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And and uh, what advice would you have to the students that are here and that really want to continue in this field? Um, well, it's nice that you asked me that question because actually I had a very nice conversation with the, um, with the contact of mine about this because I, I don't think design alone is going to fix the clothing industry or the textile industry. There's also economists and engineers and all sorts of other people in different, uh, different areas of that field re rethinking it in their own ways. Um, and I think there's really power in numbers to kind of connect to those other types of knowledge. But what I would recommend to students is also to kind of try it out, to try out the entrepreneurial side of that. See if you can find some knowledge on, on uh, business models. Maybe you can uh, do an internship with a company that focuses on these things. I think that kind of hands-on skills also in what it means to work inside a company and try to do those things is super important to also have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Micah, can you uh, react to that? Well, I think that's really true in the sense that you cannot just come up with a solution. That's not how it works. I think most good ideas are thought of in collaboration. So, uh, and in the fashion industry, that's quite hard because it's not really open because um, mm -hmm. these systems are also really well protected. Um, but still, I think the power of designers is to speculate on what could be. Um, and of course, they cannot... It's Designers are not problem solvers. I think they are imagining things yeah. and analyzing a system and looking at it from a different perspective. And that could be really valuable. But to have to make it impactful, you always have to collaborate with others. Um, yeah, to, to get that impact. Yeah, great. And uh, Sil, maybe uh, you have something to add on, on, what, uh, on how designers or researchers really can address these uh, economical, cultural, societal aspects of, uh, of uh, what they're doing? Well, um, but, uh, of course, collaboration. I would say don't create rigid, stiff systems. Keep an open mind and move along with the flow of life, processes. Uh, keep an open eye and um, stay connected yeah. to what's happening around you in the different systems. Okay, great. Uh, I, I would like to go on to the next uh, couple of student pitches. We have two more. And uh, the first student I would like to uh, invite forward is uh, Rising Lai. And uh, Rising, you have been uh, working on recycling acrylic fibers. Yes. Um, take it away if you're ready. Okay, yeah. Hi, um, everyone. This is Rising, and I'm going to present my project, Reuse the Acrylic Fiber. So uh, as a designer, I believe everything matters, whether it's natural resource or waste material. Uh, but nowadays, we don't even value our own clothes. Uh, sweaters and hoodies, which mostly make by acrylic fiber, is just an example. Two million tons of new acrylic fiber was generated every year in Europe. And meanwhile, seven, more than 7,000 tons of uh, acrylic fiber end up in landfill and incineration. Why is that? Due to its, due to its chemical complexity, there is no industrial uh, solution to upcycle acrylic fiber until the day they can be melted. So eventually, they have no second lives being thrown away after being thrown away. So as a designer, how can I take actions now? I decided to focus on developing an independent process to reuse this waste material directly and efficiently. So uh, what I did is I picked up a uh, throw garment, shatter it, and combine it with uh, 
starch glue and then place it on the mold. The acrylic fibers absorbness make the combination solid and fine and the outcomes remains lightweight, nice texture and has a lot of potentials. And with the mold, you can even see more possibilities. I can see them as the uh, interior decorations or small volume products. So with this as a first step, I would like to encourage people to uh, take, the re take this recipe as a tool, giving acrylic fiber a second life. We can take actions now and we are doing it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so reusing the acrylic fibers, um, do you have uh, something to add or to ask? Well, what I think is really interesting and also a bit scary is the fact that these mixed fibers and especially acrylic fibers, we really have no clue what to do with them. It's, it's, really, it's really waste in the sense that it cannot be reused or it almost cannot be reused. And I think what's interesting in this uh, proposal of rising is that you even see the beauty of these fibers we normally call ugly. Yeah. Uh, and that re refers a bit back to what Luz mentioned, like to see the beauty or the value in certain, well, waste yeah. is also a quality that designers can bring in here. Yeah, so you can show actually that waste is not waste, but it's like a starting point for new products as well. Yeah, or to see the value of the stuff we have. Of course, waste doesn't exist. I mean, it's just things we decided we no longer want to use, but yeah. they are still there. Yeah, Rising, is that, has that also been a starting point for you to work on, on this, uh, uh, this subject? Uh, my starting point is that uh, we got a, a bag of waste garments after we visit the, uh, vi visit the recycling uh, center. And I found out that more than 50% of garment includes acrylic fiber. So I tr started to research why this material was so commonly used and where it, where, 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 it went, where, where it went after they've been thrown away. And then I found out this problematic um, material that has no solutions until today. So that's why I'm trying to uh, like shift my mind from industrial to uh, uh, individual, like how I can reuse it, like like what I just uh, have this just reusing now. Yeah, yeah, it's great that you also take the potential impact of your solutions uh, at, at the start of the project. So that's uh, that's great. Thank you for now. Uh, I, I would like to invite forward our last student uh, uh, pitcher, and um, that is uh, Stefan Lang, and uh, Stefan has been. Um, well, he's, he's not focused on one part of the textile wheel, but on uh, multiple parts uh, and uh, created a book and design tool, tool called Textile Journeys. Uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. So, as we just saw in the short movie introduction, uh, we can see that the textile industry is intransparent and comes with many different problems along the supply chain. And we can say quite clearly that it is one of the most destructive industries in the world. My name is Stefan Lang, and I'm presenting now the project Textile Journeys I did with uh, Frederike Bartsch. While we are researching the uh, textile economy and the circular wheel with the Wache in Amsterdam, we felt that there is not one solution, and we were tackling on uh, that subject just before in the discussion, but there are so many different approaches. What we also discovered is that there is not enough knowledge about textiles, their life cycles and materiality in society. So we decided to create a tool that considers the whole textile wheel and helps to create a holistic view on textile. While we were working, there was this one central question. How can we create new choices for both designer industry and the consumer. This is the reason why we decided to create a design pool that influences people through co-creation for students, designers, makers, fab labs, and many more. Textile Journeys is a design tool which helps to raise awareness 
to lose up, but also give new perspectives and impulses to a, a more aware and sustainable direction within the field of textiles. So in total, we created six categories, uh, which are material, product, ecology, economy, social, and reflow. And each card has a front and a back side. On the front side, there is one term of each category shown, which is classified in rating scale consisting of circularity, economy, ecology, demand, and awareness. And on the back side, it contains detailed information about the term, the extent to which it plays a role in the textile industry, and further examples. So our outlook would be to have this tool not only in a physical form but in an online platform as an open source project containing different design studios and universities and that can be created with everybody. So this is not a finished project but a, a project that keeps on growing with the people who use the tool. Thank okay. you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Luz, this is probably uh, something that resonates with you. Uh, uh, would you like to ask, ask uh, Stefan something? Of course. Yes, thank you, Stefan, for this uh, short pitch. I really uh, I have to I have to say uh, props to everyone for doing such short pitches. Must be really hard to uh, <laughs> fit all that work into such a short time. Um, I am wondering um, who did you who were you able to test this tool with, and what were some nice things that came out of that? Well, we created this tool kind of based on our own experience. Frederike has a background in textile design. I have a background in interior design and architecture. So I didn't have a lot of, a lot of knowledge. Uh, Frederike had a lot of knowledge. And we created this tool um, because uh, when we started this project, we didn't have enough information. It was just overwhelming. So we kind of this t tested uh, this on the whole experience we had throughout the whole semester. And then we also, of course, uh, showed it to friends and family and um, other designers like our fellow students. Um, uh, that interacted with this tool and um, yeah now from now on this goal is that we give this to designers and they now not will have the perfect product already project in their hands but with this tool can kind of uh, have a stepping stone uh, to create sustainable solutions yeah I think that's really nice to draw on that experience as kind of being new to a topic and then trying to facilitate that that entry that entry into a new field I can imagine uh, Everyone who wants to do something on this topic could could be could benefit from such a tool. Maybe even kids as well. Um, so I think it's nice that you use that experience of kind of searching and thinking, oh, what do I do, and kind of package it for other people to learn from that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luz. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for your pitch and uh, all of our pictures. Uh, very well done. Um, I would like to continue with the panel on uh, the subject of change making skills. Uh, perhaps uh, we can start with uh, Sil. Um, Sil, we see that the students, they have a lot of ideas about how to really change the industry from different perspectives, different points of entry. But we also know that the industry is a tough cookie to crack, so to say. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? It's definitely a tough uh, cookie to crack and um, you're going to be all alone sometimes and it's, it's, it, it's, it can be a hard journey. But nevertheless, um, well, you know, be, 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 be gentle to yourself, uh, dare to doubt and appreciate the power of failure. Failure, failure is just one side. In living systems, the individual parts feed each other. A plant dies, feeds many organisms in the soil. I mean, keep it going. Can, can you uh, give an example of a uh, valuable failure that you've uh, had in your own experience, uh, perhaps, or that, you've, uh, um, th that you have uh, experienced from uh, close by? Well, um... Uh, no, well, um, sorry, nothing comes up. Nothing so comes up. So, okay, up. Let, let, uh, we'll but let I you. A lot of failures, definitely. <laughs> we'll let you think about that and maybe come back uh, in a few minutes uh, with that. Um, uh, for now, um, I, I um, want to elaborate a little bit more on the skills. You uh, talked about that uh, before. Uh, but how can you train these skills of uh, looking at a problem holistically, taking uh, uh, nature into account and uh, using that as a future leader? Uh, how do you um, yeah, train these skills? Um, 
if it's okay, I give an example of how it works in an eco restoration camp. Yeah. yeah. Um, you you use the power of ecosystems to feed soil, nature, and human needs. You try to adapt these complex systems and create a high out output with a low input and try to tap in the power of, of nature, nature's logic. Uh, I could say, come to an eco-restoration camp and have a look, see what nature gives, um, how, we, how it creates the conditions for, for, for life to flourish. Um, but I would say, for, for young entrepreneurs, students, young professionals, create the conditions for ideas to become more agile, emergent, and tuned to the system they thrive in. Be sharp and alert and see how different parts interact and feed each other. I think we, we have been thought to, to stay in rigid machine-like systems, and we have to open up and uh, see each other, look back at ourselves and interact. And that's nothing, not something you can learn uh, with a certain tool set. It's something you have to experience and um, be open for and connected. Yeah, so, so it's not a toolbox, uh, but what really does make a regenerative leader then? I wrote something down. A regenerative leader takes on the challenge to gain insights into how to build structures which are able to rapidly sense and respond to the ever-changing business climate by consulting and engaging, co-creating with the ecosystem of employees, customers, resources, society, and environment. And again, what we do, we try to take our students, our participants um, to nature, show what nature does, invite entrepreneurs, to tell about their experiences and how they uh, uh, implemented regenerative parts. And we start the conversation together with our participants. Okay, uh, let, let me check this here within the studio. Uh, Maike, do you think you're a regenerative leader yourself if you hear this? Well, I wouldn't go that far because I'm. Uh, then I have to understand better what that all um means altogether but i think what really changed is that before especially at art schools it was really about the ego about you you making something which was presented well for design in milan and and it was produced and that was the main thing and now it's far more like looking at a whole system what does happen in the system where does value run in the system is it it has it to do with fibers has it to do with fun of making something like the the labor that's needed for example yeah. but also if you look at the project of nina growing crystals is a sort of natural process that you would use to, to have a, a product that's actually changing and will change all the time. So I think this kind of thinking, not just from the ego, but to the whole system, and also a lot of collaboration that's involved, I think that's something that's really happening uh, in design now, and that's really interesting. And I think that links to what Sil also mentioned, like not only working with yourself, but with whole communities, looking at what your context is how you relate to that context. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and we got a question uh, from Zoom, from Daniela, and she asks, and uh, I will uh, first ask the question to Sil, don't we need more followers instead of more leaders? So um, <laughs> to create a movement, there's uh, this, this great video uh, uh, about, I think it's, um, it's a festival where first one guy starts to dance, and then he's just a lonely guy dancing on the field. But then once the followers start dancing with him, it starts a movement of people uh, who create a real party on this festival. And uh, what do you think on that? So don't we need to, to focus on regenerative followership, if you will, <laughs> instead of leadership? Well, isn't it like on a festival, somebody tries a new dance move and the rest follows, and the followers become the new leaders, and so it goes on and on and on. And that's, I think, what's the festival mostly about, being yourself and being yourself together with others. So yes, partly, uh, it's about followers, but followers can also become the leaders in their uh, niche, in their uh, local environment, and um, so, a regenerative leader can also follow. 
Yeah, and I would also like uh, to hear uh, Luz comment uh, on that as well. Um, so, so uh, if you will, please add Luz to the uh, to the Zoom screen, and we can hear her reaction to this as well. Uh, Luz, yes, there you are. Uh, what do you think on this? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack there, and I really like the sales reference to dancing. When you dance together, you know, there's no dance without a good follower. So that's totally, that's totally true. Um, and I think it's also really important to connect to other people. That's what we all need the most, more than anything right now. I think it's important that we connect to other people. There's power in numbers. Um, and I think for designers and for all of these projects, I think there's opportunity there is to continue the design process and see if you can also design a social prototype with it. So design the social environment that is required to kind of bring this to a next level and share it with other people and also test that out the way you would test out a product prototype. I think that's a, I think that's a, yeah, that's a wonderful kind of thing to put on the horizon. I think. Yeah, and uh, we figured out that there's no uh, ready-made toolbox, but what kind of, uh, I will still ask the question, what kind of tools uh, do you think that maybe uh, should be handed out more to the students that are uh, leaving KWK or AMFI uh, after their uh, terms with you? You're asking me? Yes. Ah. Um, well, it's very simple, I think. I would give every student that leaves any kind of school, any kind of design school, I would give them a post-it and I would write on that post-it, kind of remember that there are problems that you cannot design yourselves out of by creating more products. I think there's a real limitation in design and that's that you start to frame everything as a, as a problem that more products might solve, but of <laughs> course that's not true. Um, but you have to remember that, so I would give everyone a post-it that they can put on their toilet door so they see it every day. And then I think, uh, I think they're ready to face the world. So can, can we uh, challenge uh, the, the designers or uh, industrial designers to actually develop concepts to uh, have less products instead of more? That sounds amazing. Let's do another project. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is that a challenge that uh, you could imagine uh, doing in, uh, at KBK? Well, not developing concepts, but I think uh, a product as a solution, uh, we, yes, we, we, are, we are past that. I mean, another vacuum cleaner, why would we need it? And I think none of these students uh, would think so. So I think the, the biggest... Um, uh, problem will be that you 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 don't want to make anything new anymore, which is also really beautiful. So look at the stuff we have, and that's already happening a lot. And I think a lot in these projects too. Like I'm not making a new thing; I'm using what already exists. Um, and I think that needs a lot of creativity. So that's very interesting to work on. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, a question, it's from Steve, and uh, he says, uh, another important thing is, thing is maybe to give systems time to take notice and adapt as uh, some of the, uh, the skills that you need as a, um, as a future leader or follower. Um, and then there's a question uh, from Zoom as well to Sil, uh, what nature, uh, in, in between brackets, do you choose to be in when you talk about reconnecting? Um, well, um, as I mentioned, for me, the jungle in South America really showed me what um, the abundance, what abundance nature has. That after having this insight, insight, I can also see it in the Netherlands. In, in, in I have a, I'm working on a project in Germany, and you see nature struggling in the Netherlands in our beautiful green desert, uh, but you also see the, the, the interactiveness of nature. So yeah. it's all around you. Yeah, really. and, and the advantage of going to the uh, to the green uh, the, the green savanna here in the Netherlands is that you don't have to fly, right? Indeed, that's a big advantage. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Okay, I, I would like to thank you all. Unfortunately, uh, we are already out of uh, out of time. Um, I would like to thank all the students and their pitches. Uh, thank to thanks to all the panelists and everybody watching and posing questions here in uh, Zoom. Uh, we are. Um, going to continue with reflow uh, next week uh, we're going to uh, have a, a dutch conversation about uh, uh, borrowing and uh, uh, giving on clothes and, uh, and and the platforms behind that and uh, i would like to encourage you all to go to the website of pakhuis de zwijgen to see what all kind of other uh, uh, live casts we have uh, then uh, uh, I would like to ask everybody who, who wants to contact the Amsterdam Reflow pilot to uh, send an email to amsterdam at reflowproject.eu. And for now, thank you all for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.